And our guest is here this morning. Dr. Musa Misiani is the Chief Operations Officer at Jubilee Health Insurance. Good morning, Dr. Terry. Good morning, Dr. How are you? Great to be here. I'm Great. A, I'm fine, thank you. Yeah. Great to be here and welcome to the hot seat of Kenya's biggest conversation. Thank you. Uh, situation Room. Um, we're going to be looking into health matters today and looking at um, how innovations have come about in healthcare delivery. But yeah. before you tell us what this is all about and we can ask you those questions, city has got a little bit of an assignment for you. He's got a proverb from Cabo Verde. And uh, he's going to tell us what that is, and then maybe we'll ask you to tell us what it means to you. Okay. Mm. A hot needle burns the thread. A hot needle <laughs> burns the thread. Simple. Um, uh, the way I would think about it is, you know, um, you could have something for purpose, but if you are overzealous, <laughs> it could actually <laughs> could actually derail your purpose entirely. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> If you're that overzealous, it could delay, de- de- derail, derail you entirely. Yes, that is an excellent interpretation. Mm. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Mm. It is. It is needle quite. is a needle, but needle and thread make more sense, isn't it? Yeah. It's a needle without thread. And all because it has become, decided to become hot. Then, that's, yes, you've interpreted it well. Indeed. Mm. Great one to start off, I guess. Um, even as we get now uh, through this, and we're talking about innovations in the healthcare industry and how we can deliver health because of these innovations, let's just start off with Jubilee. I mean, we've been talking about Jubilee for a couple of weeks now and getting to know a little bit more of what is up to offer. But then, you know, give us a broad base into, you know, who, again, who Jubilee is and uh, its unique place in um, society today. So, I mean, Jubilee is, uh, is through and through a Kenyan company. Mm-hmm. I mean, um, founded in 1937. Um, I'll speak specifically to Jubilee Health, which is part of Jubilee Group. Jubilee Group has uh, Jubilee Health Insurance, Jubilee Life Insurance, and Jubilee Asset Management. Uh, we have a footprint across five countries in East and Central Africa. Uh, but for Jubilee Health Insurance specifically, we are a single-line insurer. Mm-hmm. Um, we actually are specialized in offering uh, health insurance. And what we've done over time, uh, because we've been pioneering in that space for some time as market leaders, we have been able to push the market into offering uh, solutions for insurance um, across the life spectrum, right from... Uh, products for young people all the way through the life cycle to old age um, covering both retail customers uh, of, of offering also corporate products for uh, for corporates around around the country yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, and even as you look at what the offering is what are some of these innovations that have come up with I mean because somebody would think okay yeah it's great it's insurance you pay you're covered you move yeah. Yeah. Um, so what are these innovations that we're talking about that have been life-changing in, in in terms of healthcare delivery so i think uh, fr- from where we sit uh, being being a single line underwriter actually has allowed us to really specialize in it and what we've been driving as as, as an underwriter is uh, value-based healthcare where um, we try as much as possible to focus on outcomes for for our customers uh, and, in, and and it's just not about getting the premium it's really about delivering value uh, making sure that the customers that we we cover not only enjoy the freedom of, of financial freedom of having a financial cover for health, but they also have um, access to care that actually permits them to either enjoy preventive care, and in the event that they get to curative care, we're able to cover that financial burden. But what we've been able again to do is derive products that respond to that and get into programs that respond to that driving access. For example, we have pioneered a lot of technology in terms of driving access for, for care. Uh, telemedicine, for example, is, is, is one of those that the pandemic really accelerated. Mm. Uh, we also offer drug delivery programs. We have a program which um, navigates our customers. Uh, we have that, that program is called Mesha Fiti, mm-hmm. and this has built communities around different health uh, themes. So, be it motherhood, we are able to walk the journey with a mother all the way from conception to uh, raising a child. Uh, be it someone who has, say, a chronic illness like diabetes or hypertension, we are able to navigate that 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 that, that patient and customer. 
giving them access to the right specialists, giving them the right information, making sure that we follow them up, uh, getting their drugs delivered with, uh, to them uh, conveniently. And what we've seen with that, with some of these programs, is the fact that then that has helped our customers get better outcomes mm. in, in the long term. Yeah. Can we look at three of these issues that you mentioned, starting off with telemedicine yeah. that came off, I mean, just when you talk about COVID. Yeah. Um, and then folks were not able to move. Yeah. So what does this telemedicine um, include? What, what happens here? So it, it, it depends. There's a wide spectrum to telemedicine. Um, it, could, it could range from just a phone call to a doctor. Um, you, you speak to the doctor on the other side and then they give you health advice. It could uh, extend all the way to um, a virtual consultation on, on video conference. And actually right now, uh, because there's, there are a lot of advances, it may not necessarily be localized here. Um, you can even have remote surgery because robotic surgery has, has, has moved to the point where you can actually have remote surgery. So telemedicine extends the entire spectrum from just consultation to, uh, to intervention. But specifically to what um, happens currently in this country, uh, it's largely around um, Tele teleconsultation. So we have a few providers, and Jubilee was actually one of the pioneers in actually being able to reimburse for for, for telemedicine consultations. Uh, where uh, and, and and currently, what happens is that a, a provider is is duly licensed uh, as as a, a clinic or a healthcare provider by the medical practitioners and dentist council, mm -hmm. and then that provider then is able to consult and you can have ranging from um, say for example you want a diagnosis uh, then there's, there, there are people who offer uh, mobile labs on wheels and then for treatment you get to a point where you can be able to deliver drugs so that extent um, from consultation to diagnosis to getting the therapeutic agents that that entire journey has been covered in telemedicine yeah okay mm -hmm. And what about now drug delivery? Yeah. So dr drug delivery actually is, you know, we, we live in, in a very convenient world. Um, you, you want fast food, you'll get fast food. Um, and, and, and if you want a carb, you'll, you'll just order a carb and get it. So it, it doesn't uh, then surprise anyone that we would be able to move into a direction where drugs can be delivered, you know, at your convenience. Um, Initially, this started out with non-prescription medication, mm. and then it's moved to now prescription medication. And uh, wonderfully, what that has done, uh, and I'll speak specifically to patients who have chronic illnesses, um, often what would happen is every month or so, someone with diabetes or hypertension would have to go to a clinic and see a, a, a physician and then get a refill of medication. What the combination of drug delivery and telemedicine has done is um, you're able to consult virtually, and instead of having to go to uh, f uh, physically to a provider conveniently that those drugs are brought to you, ultimately that does reduce the cost of care uh, because there is a cost in time of, mm. that you spend in going to the hospital. And actually what we've also found is just the logistics of delivering the drugs, they end up being cheaper. So ultimately what then happens is you have better adherence to medication mm. and uh, at the end of it then you have better outcomes for the patient. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. One of the things that you mentioned and which caught my attention was the aspect of preventative care. Yeah. Talk a little bit more about this. So we realize that curative care is very expensive. The technology outlay required to actually deliver curative care is quite expensive. Um, if you take an example of just investment in a normal theater, a laparoscopic tower, getting to robotics and so forth, they're very expensive. Um, yet we can be able to prevent illness higher up in the spectrum of illness. So if you're in a country like our country where you have a double burden of disease, so you have both the communicable illness, the usual malaria, diarrhea, pneumonia, and so forth, mm -hmm. and then now our population is changing, our population is aging, our life expectancy is going up. So you have a situation where we still have the communicable illnesses, but at the same time we also have a burden of chronic illnesses, diabetes and hypertension, uh, as the commonest in our country. So preventive care does, it, it actually arrests the illness up, up, upstream. And, you know, typically it used to be that you prevent communicable illnesses, sleep under mosquito net and so forth. But right now, what has happened then is for chronic illnesses, you can't necessarily prevent it, you know, the usual public health way. So what has come as an, a new approach to it is to make sure that we are able to promote healthy lifestyles, 
Um, we have changed continually to sedentary lifestyles. Mm. Uh, we are very urban, especially, you know, you're going to get your fast food, you're going to drive all the way, uh, you don't necessarily exercise as much. So pre- promoting that healthy lifestyle he's, is able, first of all, to prevent the occurrence of something like hypertension and in some instances able to reverse when it has developed. So that, in essence, then, in the long run has, um, and, and it's proven, can be able to reduce the in- incidences of these illnesses and even prevent complications because complications are very difficult to treat and expensive. Mm. Yeah. Mm. This brings me to a question that is biased because I fall in the bracket of people who would ask such a question. Yeah. When you talk of products, mm-hmm. products are sometimes determined by one's age. Yes. Now, talk about products for those who are elderly. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Um, Typically, as an underwriter, of course, you would want to uh, understand your risk well. Uh, but I'll speak specifically to the experience of, of, of Jubilee, mm-hmm. where um, we actually do have a senior's product uh, with a ceiling all the way to 80 years. Uh, for how, many, how many years ago? 80 years. 80? Zero. Yes, 80. Okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, and that, that, that experience of having uh, covered individuals all the way to, like I mentioned, the spectrum of from young a child from a J junior product to a J senior product, mm. we cover you throughout that journey. It's difficult to get such products in the market because often the, the insurance industry traditionally would shun away from covering that population because it's construed as high risk, right? Uh, but then any risk can be priced. Uh, and, and, and to be good that, you know, you can be able to get that product and out, you know, allay the financial burden of going through the chronic illness at that old age and so forth, and just open up opportunities that get you into the ecosystem of care that, for example, Jubilee would offer. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Okay. One of the things you also mentioned was uh, Maisha Fiti, and we've talked about it um, a little bit, but then, you know, just give us an overview in terms of what that is about across the spectrum. Yeah. So Maisha Fiti is, uh, is a lifestyle. Mm. Um, and the way we... The way we present it um, and the way to access it is we have a few, we have an app on the Play Store and we have a few programs. But My Shafiti is really a lifestyle. Mm-hmm. And what My Shafiti does is it, it curates um, preventive care for different subsets of populations. So I, I give an example of the programs that we run. Within My Shafiti, we have uh, the traditional corporate wellness, where we would, we would be able to go to a corporate and you know, screen the, 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 the individuals there and be able to offer care that is tailored to them. That is the traditional way to approach it. But then we also have communities for mothers, we call it the Moms Club. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think uh, so far we are about, we are about 5,000 mothers, very active community. Mm-hmm. And what that community does is, you know, the journey through from conception. There, there, there are mothers who are struggling with conception. Yeah. Uh, how, do you, how do you get care? How do you get access? How do you get directed to the right people? How do you get support, you know, the community support throughout pregnancy to delivery? And, and you know, we, we sometimes think about these things are very routine. You know, a mother would go to hospital and just give birth, and then yeah. that's it. But at the end of the day, that community of support does give them uh, does give them the uh, the required um, how would I put it strength to go through that process. Mm. Then we have communities f- that are tailored to illnesses, uh, chronic disease management programs, and uh, this is where diabetes, especially and hypertension, comes in. And we also have a mental health program where we are able to support um, our customers. And actually, this has gone beyond beyond our customers. We actually uh, bu- have built communities that are beyond uh, Jubilee customers. Mm. And, and, and importantly, what actually ties all this together is um, a program we call Navigation. Mm. So we're able to thread to thread a, a member all through the system, the ecosystem of care that is currently available and, you know, give those options available. This is delivered on a tech platform. Uh, we have a Meshafiti app. You can go to the Play Store, iOS, iOS Store, download it. It should be able to uh, deliver things like self-navigation. Who is my nearest healthcare provider? Yeah. Can I get drugs? Yeah, and we're building communities into that as well so mm-hmm. that we can be able to push tech into that space. So what impact then does it have on folks who then are seeking this care? Because you've seen, okay, fine, there's innovation, you know, you the things that we never imagined that you yeah. could do, that you could get drugs delivered to you, yeah. the, the good kind. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then uh, you... Um, 
can talk to a doctor on the phone. Yeah. I mean, it, on things that easily, 20 years ago, you wouldn't be able to do. Yeah. But what impact are we seeing that this has on patients mm -hmm. um, that is making life a little bit better for them? Are we actually able to see that there is impact that can be measured and um, achieved because of these innovations? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think you could look at it from several aspects. The, 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 the convenience of care. Um, no one, uh, how do waiting times in, in healthcare are a nightmare worldwide. Mm. Eh? No one really wants to go and sit in hospital and wait for one, two, three hours. Uh, what these tech platforms offer is that convenience of mm. having access wherever you are. Mm -hmm. uh, and what that access, the convenient access has done is seeking care is easier. So people are actually seeking care much faster. Um, and in a more convenient way. Mm -hmm. And that actually then leads to early detection, better treatment. The other bit of, of it um, is actually the cost of care. An average um, telemedicine consult, for example, and I'm not speaking this from an underwriting perspective, just a normal, even if you were to pay it in cash, could be around 1,500 shillings. If you were to walk to a hospital, just the cost of maintaining the brick and mortar sunk cost for, the, for that provider would, would actually push that consultation to an average of, say, 5,000 shillings or so. Mm. So the access in terms of finances, the access in terms of the convenience, uh, that, and, and, and you know what that has also allowed is Whereas specialists would not have been available, for example, in uh, you know the, the, the former northern frontier districts, for example, we are able to deliver that there. And we've seen programs run by hospitals like Gertrude's, where a pediatrician is consulting in Moyale, a pediatrician in Nairobi consults in Waji, and so forth. Mm -hmm. That access is actually very important. Has actually pushed uh, pushed outcomes for patients. Yeah. Does it take away from what a person now do these innovations? take away from what a person-to-person -person consult would do. Because like when you go into hospital today, isn't it that mm -hmm. they would say, well, okay, let's tell us what's going on with you. Let's prick and prod you a little bit, take your blood, take your temperature, take your pressure, etc." Does it take away from any of that if I were to get on the phone and speak to somebody and they say, well, tell me how you're feeling. And then based on one, two, three, you can do X, Y, Z. What? It, it, it actually... It actually doesn't. Okay. A majority of the illnesses that we, you know, that happen on a day-to-day -day basis would not necessarily require uh, invasive diagnostics. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll give an example of a program that we're running at, at, at Jubilee. Um, instead of going to a pharmacy and getting a drug over the counter, we're offering uh, an opportunity for you to actually consult with a doctor. And the partners that we're working with in that pharmacy, there is a nurse. If the doctor on, over the phone wants to examine, the nurse will examine you, and then you will get a prescription. Mm -hmm. And at, at a certain point where the doctor feels, okay, no, this, this cannot be managed remotely, then you're referred appropriately. It's just that a majority of the illnesses that we face the day to day, they don't probably necessarily require that you actually would go to a hospital and have invest, uh, you know, a, a barrage of investigations, which... Uh, whereas the cost may be passed on to an writer here and there or, or, or out of pocket, it's not a victimless uh, cost. <laughs> yeah, it, it actually is a cost to the healthcare system. Yeah. Then there's the issue of understanding the possible illnesses you may have. The, uh, there's always talk and there's always mention of uh, having a health check. Yeah. They have all sorts of names and they're branded differently. Yeah. Um, the idea is to try and figure out whether you're healthy and if you're not, what it is that might ail you. Mm -hmm. Now, when you have a health cover, do health covers consider such costs where I can ask to go through a process that will determine what my health status is? Absolutely. Um, actually, I think embedded in all Jubilee covers is, is an annual wellness check. Um, what we encourage uh, is have a continuous care, have continuity of care. You will find, um, at, at the risk of being controversial in the medical space, that a lot of the wellness packages, so to speak, assume that a human being is a chunk of organs, you know. <laughs> we'll do a heart check, we'll do a kidney check, we'll do a liver check, we'll do, and so forth. <laughs> this is a patient, and the patient has had a journey over time. And then this follow-up would allow the doctor who's been following up to be able to determine what is the most optimal test. I see, uh, you know, 25-year-old young men being screened for prostate illness. Mm. I mean, 
it's a cost. And like I mentioned earlier, it's not a victimless cost. That, that is a cost to the healthcare system that would be used somewhere else. But isn't it better to have that check <laughs> at that point in time? I'll say this because yeah. as someone who has consumed health products for a long time, yeah. it then becomes a pre-existing condition, does it yeah. not? It does. And, and, and then you as underwriters, it mm. gives a little breathing space, does it not? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, no, not necessarily. No, not necessarily. No. <laughs> 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 you see, if you are unwell, I, for instance, I'm hypertensive. Yeah. Okay, and I have a problem with my blood sugar. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. it's a a pre-existing condition, mm -hmm. and whenever I renew my my health products, I declare it. I tell mm -hmm. them this is what I have. Yeah. Okay, now. What it therefore means is that the amount that the insurance and the upfront they tell you, we will cover up to 10% mm -hmm. of your cover. Mm -hmm. You are told in advance. Mm -hmm. Now, why I'm asking this question of whether it is allowed, and he has told me, yes, they have that package of wellness, is because it is infinitely better, for, in, in my opinion as a layman, for a, a, an insurance company, an underwriter, to bear that cost of that health check so that you know. Mm -hmm. Because there are times you have an underlying condition and you actually don't know. Yeah, it's true. Very true. You you go to hospital exhibiting one condition yeah. and the process, they figure you have something else. Yeah. Yeah. Again, I say this from experience. Mm -hmm. You go in with one problem and you're told, actually, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, we yeah, might have to look at this. That, that one you also have, but yeah. Yeah. we've also figured you also have this. Yeah. So from an underwriter's position, mm -hmm. this is really my question. Mm -hmm. The 10% that you normally place as what you will cover mm -hmm. for pre-existing conditions. Mm -hmm. Why 10%? Um, so I, I'll, I'll go back a bit and uh, just answer a bit on the wellness checks. Mm -hmm. Yes, they should be covered. They are covered. Mm -hmm. uh, we cover them liberally. It's important for us to actually understand understand the risk going into, into the business. But you see, insurance is underwriting. And underwriting is a, is a technical science in this sense that you are collecting a premium and you're likely to incur a cost that is exceedingly higher than the premium, right? So what underwriting does is then, um, how would I put it, S uh, mitigate the risk, okay? So that when you're accepting the risk, you are not going to have outflows that are way beyond what you've collected as premium. Mm. Yes. And there are those conditions that you already know because um, if you look at an individual who comes in with a pre-existing condition, for example, mm. they definitely would incur cost. Yes. So, as opposed to, you know, insurance works on a Pareto principle, 20% will claim, 80% will not. Um, so, if you have an individual who will definitely claim, then you have to either price that risk, mm -hmm. so usually you'd find that they say, okay, yeah, we will accept with this condition, but then we will load a certain amount on the premium. On yeah, mm -hmm. So that the cost of that care that is definite is able to be covered. So that, again, you know, as a business, you have to be a going concern. Sure. Yeah. We're going to take a break, but in the meantime, we, and there are many things to be discussed, um, Doc, but where do we find you? It seems that there's a number that people call, and I don't know if that particular phone is under the table, <laughs> but, that, you know, People complain that we try to call Jubilee, but nobody picks up the phone. How are we supposed to find you? So, I mean, we um, <laughs> we have an omni-channel system of support. Mm. You can find us on our website, you can find us on Twitter, you can find us on Instagram, on LinkedIn, and so forth. But we have a, a, a call a call center. Mm. Um, with actual humans behind Yes, yes, with actual humans, yeah. <laughs> it's, not, it's, not, it's not automated. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not automated. I mean, it, it's one of those that has, a, uh, you know, escaped automation. Right now, uh, across across business, everyone is on to automation. Mm -hmm. But Jubilee still retains a, a very human touch. Mm -hmm. uh, you can be able to call through and, you you know, you, you will find that there will be a human on the other side who will, who, who will be able to, to sort it out. A big issue is information that I would give um, over the phone, via email, on social media about my health status because I'm not physically coming into mm -hmm. the hospital mm -hmm. or into the clinic. And if that is going to be made, if Jubilee is providing this gateway through which I can access this healthcare, you're going to have a lot of my information. Mm -hmm. You have my name, my birth date, my, uh, what do they normally ask you for? All those things that they mm -hmm. ask you for, mm -hmm. but that data privacy and uh, protection comes into play here. Yeah. How do you safeguard 
all of this where because you can't see me mm -hmm. you're going to need to have all the information about me in order to treat me yeah how will you protect me when it comes to my data and information so um we we do have and i think the data protection act actually sort of pushed us a very many steps ahead in terms of data protection within the region and the continent. There's a regulatory framework that exists within the Data Protection Act um, where any data processor, any data handler is required to maintain a certain level, um, a certain level of um, encryption, minimization of data and so forth, so that you only collect data that you require. And even when you do that, um, you have to pass it securely within your network. Mm. And you only limit access to whoever will be will be required to, to have that, eh? to, to have access to that data. Mm -hmm. um, so cybersecurity as it were, just protecting the data that you, you've already collected, again, is a, is a big area of investment, especially for uh, companies like Jubilee. And what we've done is, you know, push encryption quite significantly and push uh, cybersecurity mm -hmm. and put investments within that space. The, the important bit is to understand that the communication and the channels for access are secure channels for access. It's, it's not a random phone call. Okay. Yeah, so you'll find that either uh, you're using a teleconferencing tool that has uh, secure, secure encryption and secure networks uh, so that we, we ensure that, one, we've protected access uh, in a safe space, but because medical data is especially sensitive, we also ensure that your medical data is secure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. The packages that are offered or things that you're then able to do whereby um, you can have access to healthcare the year through, how does it affect cost because of this innovation? We're looking at more expensive premiums, same premiums, are they lower? Because that's one big mm -hmm. question that pops up <coughs> for people when we're talking about healthcare. I have to be able to afford it. There are exciting times ahead. I think... Um Tech is disrupting a lot of spaces, and, mm. and insurance is one of them. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, maintaining an operation in a, in a hospital, the, the typical brick and mortar hospital, is very expensive. There are, there are many costs for setup, there are many costs for maintaining staff, and even just uh, the costs in time. Customers come in, they have to wait, you don't have a scheduling system. There's a lot of wastage within the traditional healthcare system. Um, so, tech offers a bit of solution in that. Of course, we are still many, um, uh, I think the world is not yet really ready for a tech-first health system. Mm. We are getting there. We are getting there. It will probably, I mean, it may be very obvious very soon. The same way, you know, it was very difficult to imagine that you would have money sent to you via text message, right? right. <laughs> so we will get there sometime. Um, and the exciting thing about this is, like I mentioned, the access is amazing. Wherever you are, you can access it. It's very cost effective. Mm. It's very cost effective. Because healthcare is probably the last frontier market where we've not commoditized things. You know, you don't know um, if I have a common cold, uh, you know, I don't know how much it's going to cost. Mm. Yeah, it, depending on who sees me, depending on where I go to be seen, you don't know how much it's going to cost. What tech does, it's going to standardize a bit of that and just push that access. And it's going to be, uh, because the ultimate cost of care is, is, is less definitely the insurance market will respond to that. Okay, so yes. let's break it down in this way. So if you typically, if you were to walk into hospital today, even if you were covered, you know, by Jubilee, for example, mm -hmm. if you were to walk into hospital today <clears throat> and you have whatever issue presenting with and uh, you hand over your card or whatever it is, likelihood is that you do your triage whatever and it's going to come to maybe some 2500 shillings just for them to look at you literally yeah. before anybody has even touched you then you go sit in front of the doctor and that goes catching maybe 3000 shillings yeah. these are the numbers that we're talking about today 2000 to 3000 shillings just for consultation yeah. you've not been treated nobody's drawn blood nothing has happened mm -hmm. right they've taken your weight height etc and you're already at 5000 bob mm -hmm. okay whether it's coming off your insurance or whether it's coming out of your pocket. Mm. So are we saying now, Doc, that uh, 
with these innovations that we could see this money which folks are currently paying today reduce significantly because you mentioned already if i'm going to do a telecall with the doctor i probably spend up a, a 1500 shillings and i'm going to do that from the comfort of wherever it is that yeah. i'm sitting i do not have to travel i do not have to connect i don't have to do any of that mm -hmm. uh, so 1500 shillings and i can talk to a doctor and i can tell my symptoms and they can tell me this is what it's likely to be etc etc right mm -hmm. are we saying that this five thousand six thousand many times 8,000 shillings that you have spent before blood has been drawn, anything has happened, mm -hmm. are we actually saying that this money can be significantly reduced with these innovations? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and, and I'll give a practical example. Mm -hmm. um, right now, our, uh, our teleconsultations at pharmacies, they cost a dollar. It's about 150 shillings or so. Mm. Whereas if you had gone to a traditional provider, it would cost you upwards of 2,000, 2,500 and so forth. Not considering travel. Not considering travel. Not considering just the inconvenience of, you know, just sorting yourself out and the time that you take. It, it is, uh, telemedicine is extremely cost effective. Mm. It's very efficient. The convenience in time, the convenience in place, that actually is um, one of the biggest selling points for telemedicine. And like I mentioned, exciting times ahead because when you actually reduce the cost of care, what then happens is uh, insurance companies responding to it, less premiums, insurance is more affordable, you have more penetration, you have more access to health financing, and you have a level of protection that allows you to seek care faster. So there, there are a lot of downstream effects that come from just having that convenience. But, but just l l let, me, let, me, let me come back to, to, for example, what we're running. Mm -hmm. um, you pick up your phone, you call, you know, 0709 That's a Jubilee call yes, center number. Yes, City knows that number. Yes, yeah. oh, City knows it. Yes, <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and, and, and it's human beings who pick it, right? <laughs> I can confirm that. You pick that and then you say, okay, I, I, I'm, I'm your customer. I need to have access to telemedicine, right? Uh, <laughs> so what, what, what then happens is, we, we try and thread that for you. We'll say we have X and X providers or this, this, this pharmacy is next to you mm. as, as a pharmacy teleconsult. The cost, and this is actual numbers that we've seen across the industry, is actually close to 60% less than what you would have paid if you'd have walked into a normal provider. Mm. So they are very, there's a lot of potential. It's just that adoption may take some time. But, I mean, looking at all these things, it's it's obvious then that you know we should probably be pushing this a bit more does it preclude folks who are not in urban peri-urban areas because if we're saying that this kind of health that, because look a lot of folks who then are in rural areas the element of travel and i'm just trying to imagine the element of travel is a big deal when it comes to going to seek medical care mm -hmm. right or to attend a medical facility you mentioned you know expectant mothers for example it's a big deal we still have an issue where many many women are giving birth on the way yeah. to wherever and it's mm -hmm. an it's an issue mm -hmm. right so um how would this play out in an area whereby travel is a problem uh even getting this medical care is an issue how would that play out whereby we would now try to introduce something whereby mm -hmm. you can speak on the phone to a medical provider? And I'm not talking about peri-urban or urban areas. Yeah. I'm talking about rural Kenya. Yeah. Um, first off, as a disclaimer, not everything can be treated remotely. Sure. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, but a majority of illnesses that we have on a day-to-day -day can be treated remotely. Mm. One of the biggest barriers to access to care is just physical access, the distance to, mm. to the next available healthcare providers. And if you uh, come from some rural areas in this country, you'll find it, you know, the, the next facility is 20, 30, 40 kilometers away. The innovation then comes in at this point. Imagine a situation where uh, you have a child, very remote village, you can't be able to get to the next healthcare, healthcare provider, mm. but you are able to call a doctor, and the doctor is, is telling you, by the way, if your child has, had, has passed loose stool four or five times, maybe it's time to be going to hospital, and maybe as you're going to hospital, do one, two, three. Mm. It saves lives. And I mentioned earlier, um, a, a, a project that was being done by the Gertrude Children's Hospital. There is actually publications from that that actually show outcomes for children in rural areas 
improved significantly mm. because then instead of you know in some of these places it's difficult to get specialized care it's difficult to even just get a normal gp to take care of, of, of the patient yeah. but you bring in that gp to, uh, to 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 the patient yeah even if it's not direct intervention there are interventions that can be done uh, remotely that actually impact the outcome of of of, of the care safely and cost effectively this is interesting because then what would it mean for example if these same areas that we're talking about where we know that healthcare and access to it is, is an issue what would it cost you know usually we say okay if you pay premiums per month or pay premiums per year what would it cost for somebody who says look i do not ha i don't have doc i don't have mm -hmm. uh, the 5000 shillings a month uh, you know are there packages that can be created for folks who then would be able to jump on a, if I pay a certain amount? You know how we have the the, the Kadogo economy. Mm -hmm. If you can buy soap for 20 shillings, can I also access medical care for 20 shillings? Mm -hmm. And I'll explain that if I put a, away a little bit of something every day, can I then have access to this every month? Mm -hmm. So that at some point, if I do need to call somebody, the the City always gets on me with, for this. It's the community health uh, workers or community health promoters, mm -hmm. right? That I can have access to one of them under the cover because I've paid 50 shillings or mm -hmm. 100 shillings per week. Is there something like that that takes those folks into consideration? Yeah, so we, in addition to offering um, coverage over the spectrum of life, mm. we also offer coverage over the spectrum of income. Mm. Uh, and it's interesting that you mentioned um, 20 shillings a day. Mm. We actually do have a cover, mm. we call it cover borer, mm -hmm. uh, which is about 6,200 shillings per annum. Oh, yeah? Okay. Yeah, so it's actually 20, it's actually 20 shillings oh, a day. Wow. Literally, it's 20 shillings oh, a day. Wow. So okay. you, you, literally, uh, you took the words out of, <laughs> out of my mouth. I see. And, and with that, you actually unlock the, the entire benefit of being a Jubilee insurance customer. Really? Yes. What's the entire benefit? The entire benefit is, you know, you, uh, the cover border is uh, predominantly an inpatient cover. Mm -hmm. um, so you'll have coverage for your inpatient admissions and so forth. But these communities that I'd mentioned, this access to telemedicine, all these things, mm -hmm. they are available, they're unlocked. Because, you know, we, what we believe is, um, yes, there are, different, there, there are different tests, there are different products that, you know, any one of us could be able to go and buy. Yeah. But every individual customer who chooses and places their faith in Jubilee should be able to enjoy the same privilege as any other. And it doesn't matter how much the premium is. Yeah. Right. So, and literally, you can actually pay the 20 shillings a day. Will Jubilee take 20 yeah. shillings a day or does Jubilee want me to come and pay you the 6,200 shillings at once? And my, I may not have it, but can is there a basket somewhere mm -hmm. where I can be putting in the 20 shillings a day mm -hmm. and that would now allow me access to this healthcare that you speak of? Yeah, I mean, we, we are build, uh, we're building capacity around that. Mm. And um, one of the things that we actually tr try and encourage, because we, we have sister businesses, Jubilee Asset Management, for example, if someone may not be able to pay the 6,200, you know, they can put the 20 bob in a money market fund and you can be able to use that as a premium. And we've seen a lot of creativity around, you know, affordability of paying premiums. Mm -hmm. uh, there are those that, you know, you can be able to get uh, insurance premium financing. There are those who opt to take uh, insurance premium financing. Mm -hmm. And those, there are those that opt to, you know, create a wallet and then use um, uh, the interest thereof to pay to pay the premium. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, the, there is a population of individuals who we refer to as working within the Juakali sector, mm -hmm. the informal sector. Mm -hmm. We are also told that... Uh, the by far consist of the vast majority of people who actually work or do business in this country just mm -hmm. in terms of numbers what we've just spoken of seems to meet their need yeah. but then there's the question of do they know about it uh, and what efforts have been made to ensure mm -hmm. that that cadre of citizen throughout the country actually gets this information just mm -hmm. this bit that we've spoken of I mean, even this conversation is informational, isn't it? Oh, it most certainly <laughs> is, but you're not here every day, are you? Yes, yes, absolutely, yes. yeah. <laughs> so what, 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 what are you trying to do? <laughs> that was just a minute. <laughs> yeah, City is, uh, is, is really holding me to it. It's in fine form. Yes. Yeah, um, 
we we have done a lot of promos um and one of the things that we have done as jubilee is uh, we have an initiative called afia machinani <laughs> where we take jubilee to the ground um we we have partners like the Khan hospitals for example where we organize medical camps and we actually would go to the ground and our, our, our agents would be able to speak to some of these products and we've seen a lot of uptake um there are other ways that we're working towards ensuring that you know the 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 sign up journey is straightforward and easier um right now we will keep pushing the afia machinani narrative so we've done tours around the rift valley in akuru naivasha uh we, we we are planning to do some some bit more uh, within this year and that that creates a vibe to it but then again we're just trying to push promotional materials here and there uh, we have um informational uh, brochures but importantly i think trying to demystify it the best is going to the ground and actually meeting the juakali and actually saying you know hey, there's a product here that actually works for you i think that because insurance is actually a personal sell it's 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 a it's a, it's a push product no one works True. up to say they want to buy insurance yeah. so the agent actually having that relationship with the customer is what will actually push it up is there room for the customer to give you feedback even as you tell them about the value of the product so that you can actually understand what yes they've understood what you've told them but then there's what they think they need and what yeah. they know they need yeah yes so jubilee we don't put out products that we think are right for jubilee we spend a lot of time understanding what the customer wants mm. understanding uh we, we conduct a lot we commission a lot of research on 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 actually almost a quarterly basis what what does the customer actually want because otherwise you'll create a product that you you know you you'll buy yourself <laughs> and <laughs> the the best way to actually see if then that product responds you know customers vote with their feet are they buying the product and 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 uh, for us at least we've seen that customers are taking up our products very well yeah. which is encouraging to see that it's meeting a certain need nevertheless because of continuous engagement you get to understand market trends markets are dynamic you, you can be able to then uh, you know pivot and and create products that actually respond to that need an example is for example um uh, the, the young the young kenyans um, let me not say young kenyans as you, if i'm very you, 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 we young kenyans yeah. <laughs> I, I you, you've taken the question out of my mouth because yes, yes. that is actually where i was heading yes, yes. please continue uh, who work in the digital space who work in the gig economy uh, there are products that actually respond to that the product that respond to a gig economy mm. because you you know that someone is going to get a windfall in 3 months and then they <laughs> may not get a windfall the rest of the year yeah. can we be able to work through a situation that a product that responds to that need mm. so arguably there a product for everyone i literally mean it when i say there's a product for everyone consider yeah. starting a little earlier even yeah given the importance of insurance yeah. and actually you cannot it is not possible to overstate yeah. the importance of insurance yeah. as someone comes of age and they are understanding and they understand that at some point in their lives they're going to have to look after themselves mm-hmm. say secondary school mm-hmm. say the time when people are about to go to college yeah. apart from just the product just ensuring that that information is there so that it is understood mm-hmm. because health insurance is that insurance does a lot more than just cover mm-hmm. you for health yeah. it does very many other very things true, true. and a lot of the times 